In the United States alone, more than 85 million people have a brain with a problem. That means that one in every five brains has a problem, like a traumatic brain injury or ADHD, a sports concussion, a learning disability, or one of the dementias. Look around your table. At least one of you has a brain with a problem already. <laughs> and at some point in the next five years, half of you will either have a brain with a problem or be an adult caregiver or a parent of someone who has a brain with a problem. I'm a cognitive and educational psychologist, and I conduct brain training research. My team and I have studied the brain training results from thousands and thousands of children and adults with broken brains and published our research in multiple medical and psychology journals. My message today is simple. I'm going to share some of our research. I'm going to talk about some lessons we've learned about effective cognitive training. And I'm going to tell you two stories. That's it. Two life-changing stories. Stories of hope and transformation. The message, you can train your brain and transform your tomorrow. In 2015, my son had a problem with his brain. In fourth grade, not only did he have ADHD, he could not spell his own name. I discovered this standing in the hallway of his school one night, reading a paper he had written about his dad, a military officer. At the top of the page, he had written his name, Evan William Moore. He spelled his middle name W-I-L-Y-U-M. He wrote, my dad is in the Air Force. People salute my dad, S-A-L-O-O-T. At 10 years old, he was still writing phonetically, spelling words the way they sound. That is not how we write at 10 years old. That's how the average five and six-year-old writes. As a child development specialist and a cognition researcher, I could not believe that I had missed this. Was I so busy taking care of other people's children that I hadn't noticed my own child was struggling so much in school? In that moment, I realized that not only was I not going to win Mother of the Year Award that year, <laughs> but I felt like I had failed my child. So the next day, with my doctor hat on, I began the process of having him evaluated. And what we found out was that he had slipped through the cracks because he was a strong reader. He had a rare form of dyslexia. And I'm not sure why I was surprised when I found out and pressed him about it that he had been feeling dumb and defeated for a very long time. And that's pretty typical with children with ADHD. They do struggle with self-esteem issues, especially when compounded by a learning struggle. So when you think about children with ADHD and hyperactivity, that's Evan. He could have been the poster child for ADHD. He needed constant entertainment, and if you didn't give it to him, he'd create it himself in some form of trouble. <laughs> you know the type. As a toddler, when he wanted something he couldn't reach, he'd use a dining room chair to, as a ladder. At one point, I came home, and my husband had tied the dining room chairs to the center of the table. <laughs> to keep Evan from falling off. <laughs> he was so active and so mischievous that at three years old, he unscrewed the handrail from the wall in the stairway and removed every cabinet door from the basement entertainment center. <laughs> By age four, he would run laps around the house until he collapsed in sheer exhaustion. At the dinner table, he barely sat on the edge of his seat. In fact, he it preferred to stand while he ate. He was formally diagnosed with ADHD in kindergarten. And in school, he talked and talked and talked. His teachers described him as very dramatic. <laughs> it was evident that he had trouble in social situations as well. He would frequently speak out of turn, not think before he spoke, and would insult people, not meaning to. 
Again, typical ADHD behavior. In fact, he said to me one night as I was tucking him into bed, Mom, if they gave grades for it, I would get a D minus in making friends. So I enrolled him in a brain training program. We discovered he had significant auditory processing deficits. And so the program I chose would be able to drill down on those auditory processing deficits in addition to word attack skills and phonemic awareness, as well as working on his memory and processing skills and reasoning. And so what we didn't know when I started that program was the impact that brain training would have on Evan's entire life. <clears throat> he spent the next nine months working with a brain trainer. She drilled down not only on his auditory processing and word attack skills, but also on skills like memory and attention, processing speed, and visual processing. See, cognition is more than just one skill. It's multiple skills that we need to think and learn. And Evan's trainer understood this model of learning. She pushed him, challenged him, motivated him, and loved him. And by the end of 120 hours of cognitive training, he could spell. By seventh grade, my son, who could not spell his own name just three years prior, qualified for gifted and talented language arts at school. By the end of eighth grade this past year, he tested into college level English and math. <sighs> yeah. Instead of going to high school this fall, he's going to an early colleges program. His goal is to have his bachelor's degree at 19 and a PhD in computational neuroscience by 22. <laughs> he's a talented musician in the city's youth symphony. He no longer shows signs of ADHD. He's well adjusted socially. And most important, he likes who he's become. And we like who he's become. He's a wonderful, living, breathing example of how you can train your brain and transform your tomorrow. Evan's story seems extraordinary, doesn't it? But it's not. In my research, this is what we see all day, every day. In a randomized controlled trial, published in Applied Cognitive Psychology, we looked at the effects of 60 hours of cognitive training for children ages 8 to 14 with learning struggles just like Evans. And what we found were significant changes in every cognitive skill, the difference in six out of seven between the two groups, and a 26-point difference between the treatment and control group in change in IQ score. And in a follow-up article that we published in Neuropsychiatric Disease and Treatment with the ADHD children, we found that not only did they have significant changes in cognitive skills, but the training effects transferred to improvements in real life, including increased confidence, greater self-discipline, greater cooperative behaviors, improved academic performance, better sleep habits, and even improvement in sports and hobby performance and participation. Another study was conducted by my colleague, Christina Ledbetter, a clinical neuroscientist at LSU. And she did functional magnetic resonance imaging of the brains of at-risk high schoolers who had gone through 60 hours of brain training. And what she found was that changes in connectivity in the brain directly correlated with changes on every single cognitive test score. And when she compared the changes in the brain between the treatment and control groups, she found greater global efficiency in the kids who had gone through brain training. And in a large observational study of nearly 20,000, yes, 20,000, actual brain training clients from 70 clinics around the country, I found statistically significant changes in every single cognitive measure. 
and results for more than 2,000 adults from the same clinics were the same. And these are just a few examples of the research that we've conducted on this brain training program. And we've also published work on traumatic brain injury and age-related cognitive decline. In fact, since 2015, we've been amassing a convergence of evidence on this brain training methodology. You can find all of our research on our website because it's far too much to cover in an 18-minute talk. So let me just share another story. Five years ago, Alice was a bright, active, vibrant teenager who loved the theater. She wanted to be a meteorologist. She loved astronomy. Barely on the autism spectrum, she missed a social cue once in a while, but was otherwise well-adjusted and healthy. One Saturday morning after a big snowfall, she went sledding with her family. And as she approached the bottom of the hill, she fell off her sled, hit her head, and shattered her wrist. At the emergency room, they put a cast on her wrist and sent her home to heal. But that's not what happened. They missed the traumatic brain injury that she suffered when she fell off the sled. And so over the next several months, she developed anxiety. She stopped eating and became life-threateningly anorexic. In fact, she spent several months in an inpatient eating disorders facility. She had stopped driving because she couldn't process information quickly enough to safely navigate the roads. She lost her ability to do math and, in fact, was barely able to graduate from high school through a homeschooling program. The lasting effects of her traumatic brain injury weren't so mild after all. They had fundamentally changed her. So in a research study, Alice completed 60 hours of brain training exercises, just like Evan. Using a ticking metronome and a stopwatch, tangrams, colorful cards, Alice's trainer gave her a mental sweat and worked out her cognitive skills. Her training sessions were intense, and she was frequently frustrated. But her trainer pushed her and motivated her, kept her engaged and on task, helped her set and realize goals, leveraged the amazing plasticity of her brain, and helped her recover and even develop further her cognitive skills. By the end of the study, Alice was driving again. She got a job as a barista in a fast-paced coffee shop. She enrolled in college and could finally see her future again. And just this week, she was traveling Europe with her friends. Another beautiful, living, breathing example of how you can train your brain and transform your tomorrow. So what makes one method of brain training work and another not? I believe there are three keys to effective cognitive training, lessons that we've learned through our research. And those keys are complexity, intensity, and human delivery. Why complexity? Because cognition is complex. According to the ever-evolving horn carroll theory of cognition, the most widely recognized theory of intelligence, there are 18 broad cognitive abilities and 91 narrow cognitive abilities. So if cognition is complex, shouldn't training be complex as well? Programs that are only addressing memory or attention are missing an opportunity to train the complexity of cognition. Why intensity? Simple. Intensity creates the mental sweat that drives neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to change with experience. And why human delivery? This is the cornerstone of effective brain training. The human relationship in clinician-delivered cognitive training enhances outcomes in several ways. First, human delivery drives the development of self-efficacy. By creating opportunities to master experience through verbal persuasion, through helping a client manage the stressful responses to being in a training environment, and by modeling the training tasks themselves, clients can develop self-efficacy or their belief in their ability to accomplish a task. 
Human delivery also enables dynamic feedback. Research has shown over and over again that treatment outcomes are increased by dynamic, specific, and frequent feedback. Adaptation. Human delivery enables adaptation on the fly of the training program. Human trainers are able to push clients almost to the point of frustration, but pull back when they need to. They're able to add complexity to increase engagement. They're able to decrease complexity in order to manage any frustration. And finally, human delivery increases treatment compliance. We know that the number one predictor of therapy success is the relationship with a the therapist. So the human trainer can be the difference between finishing an intervention and dropping out. And a human trainer can deliver the program with fidelity the way in which it was intended. So now that we've talked about the benefits of human delivery, let's look at what human delivery looks like. In this model, the clinician or cognitive trainer sits across the table from the client and uses a variety of hands-on materials and manipulatives to deliver the training. The trainer is actively involved either through coaching, encouragement, or friendly competition. The trainer keeps the session fast-paced, intense, and gives specific feedback and direction, and pushes the client through frustration while keeping him on task to ensure that his goals are met and that he experiences success today so that he can thrive tomorrow. So let me leave you with this. There is hope in brain training. We are not stuck with the cognitive cards that we've been dealt. Cognitive skills that are weak can be made strong. We see it in our research and in our clinical work all day, every day. And so with complexity and intensity and human delivery, you can train your brain and transform your tomorrow. Thank you.